gentlemen, welcome to the seventh lecture. Today we talk about the physics of climate change. There have been many talks about climate change. I would like to talk from the physics point of view about climate change. But today I will start with something a little bit different because when I first got in contact with the subject of climate change, that was when I was a young student. It was in the end of the 1970s and my professor was involved not only in the energy group of the German Physics Society but also in the peace movement. And at that time people talked about the nuclear winter. And we'll see in a minute what nuclear winter has to do with climate change. Well, on this picture here you can see uh, what happens if there is a war? This is from Kuwait in 1990 and you see there are fields of oil burning. It produces a lot of dust and it changes also the atmosphere. And already in 1970 people were thinking about what is happening when there is a nuclear war. You know in these days um, there was still a cold war going on between East and West, or better, let's say, between USA and the Soviet Union. And people were worried that it's not go only going to be a nuclear war at some time, but in addition, due to the nuclear war, there will be a climate change afterwards, which has even more immense effects on the people. So at that time people for the first time thought about anthropogenic changes of climate and people started to simulate what happens if there's a lot of dust or fog in the atmosphere at a large scale like in a nuclear war where it has long-term effects. We know about those effects from the eruptions of volcanoes in the past that it happens that for some years the, um, the output of agriculture is changed because of dust in the atmosphere, which changes climate. And people were worried that a nuclear war could have a so-called nuclear winter. Everything becomes colder and darker and there will not be enough uh, output from agriculture anymore and people will die of starvation as one of the possibilities. Another issue in the discussion about the effects of nuclear war was the ozone hole because one effect of nuclear bombs is that the atmosphere is ionized and that there are radioactive particles in the atmosphere and those particles have the possibility to destroy ozone layer and therefore there was a discussion about the ozone effects. In this respect, they also found out that it's not only radioactivity which destroys the ozone hole, but also certain chemicals. Those ozone depleting chemicals mainly came from refrigerators, they were halocarbons and several other chemicals. On this plot here you show how since 1960, the concentration of ozone in the high atmosphere is reducing until about 1990. It's going steeply down and the reason for that was found out to be the halocarbons, especially the chlorofluorocarbons, so-called CFCs. And what was the effect of this? depletion of the ozone hole. The effect of the high layer ozone is that it blocks ultraviolet light from the sun. So if the concentration of the ozone goes down, the so-called ozone hole is nothing else but a reduction of the natural concentration of the ozone. This happened especially in, in the area around the South Pole, but you also see it nowadays at the North Pole. And in all the surrounding there, there was a higher rate of ultraviolet light arriving on the ground. 
And for people, this has a very bad effect because, as you know, the ultraviolet light produces skin cancer. I was once, for example, in New Zealand on the beach and everybody at the beach had to wear hats and also the children had to wear all kind of uh, clothes not to get too much ultraviolet light on the skin. But ultraviolet light makes not only skin cancer, it also um, can harm the whole food production chain as well in the sea as on land. Therefore, people realize that there is a big problem for mankind due to that. And then at some point people tried to do something against and they found a worldwide agreement that certain chemicals are not allowed to put anymore into the atmosphere. That was the so-called ban on CFCs done in Montreal, in the Montreal Protocol in 1987. And due to this ban, the concentration of these dangerous chlorofluorocarbons is reduced since then. And since then, the curve going down is not as steep anymore. And now, since 1990 about, it's recovering. And slowly the concentration goes up again, so that in about 50 years or 100 years, we will have a similar strong ozone layer as we had it when I was a child. Okay, so this can be counted as a success story for global cooperation. In lecture 5 already, I showed you a similar plot. This here was the plot of the concentration of CO2, of carbon dioxide, this time starting at 400,000 years ago until today. And also here we see a steep rise of the CO2 since the industrialization, as I explained you. We also know nowadays that CO2 in the atmosphere is also dangerous. It doesn't produce cancer like ozone, but it produces global warming and will have a lot of very strong effects on our future. Therefore, it would be natural if we do as we did in 1987 with ozone. We make an agreement, a worldwide agreement that we ban CO2, so the emission of CO2, which means the burning of fossil fuels, and then at some point climate will recover again. Why is that not done? Well, the point is the effect on our industry when we ban the burning of fossil fuel is immense. At the moment we have the problems with coronavirus and we see that everything changes in industry. Our economies have real problems. If we, uh, if we ban the use of fossil fuels, things will happen in a similar way and at least up to now people thought or people fight it against, especially industry fight it against having a reduction of fossil fuels. So in CO2 the business is not as easy as in ozone. In ozone there was only a small part of the industry affected and one had easy ways to replace this ozone depletion chemicals by other stuff. The same we have to do with CO2. We can replace fossil fuels by renewable energies. And you know that is what this lecture is about. So let's go a bit deeper into the CO2 business. The plot about the last thousands of years is maybe not as interesting as the plot from the last 10 or 20 years. So in this plot here you see the years from 1964 until 2018 and to see this continuous rise of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. This blue line here is a measurement. The measurement is done in Hawaii 
Why in Hawaii? Because in Hawaii there's a very little effect from the closed surrounding. If you do a measurement in the center of Europe or in the US, you will have more fluctuations in CO2 because there are maybe power plants close by which produce CO2 and there are also a lot of plants around which reduce CO2. Therefore you go on a small island in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific where you can really measure the concentration of CO2 in the clean atmosphere. Of course similar measurements have been done everywhere in the world and all these things are consistent. So there's no doubt anymore there's a continuous rise of CO2. If you look in more detail on the curve, of course, you see there are these small wiggles. If you look at it in more detail, you find out there's one wiggle per year. And the reason for these wiggles is also clear. In spring, plants take CO2 out of the atmosphere and produce carbon or solid material, plant material out of it. And in autumn, there's a degradation of the plants. The leaves fall down from the trees and they are rotting. And during this process of rotting, when bacteria uh, eat these trees, uh, CO2 is produced again. So this fluctuation of going up and down is the variation due to vegetation in spring and autumn. If you think a bit more about it, you could wonder that I talk about a global CO2 concentration and still I see I talk about spring and autumn. When there's spring in the northern hemisphere, there's autumn in the southern hemisphere. So spring and autumn are interchanging in the north and south half of the earth. So why is there then an effect? Well, the effect is still there. Because in the northern atmosphere there is more land than in the southern one where there is more sea. And therefore there is more vegetation on land in the northern atmosphere. So the summer-winter difference is dominated by the northern hemisphere. Okay, so in addition to this uh, small up and down every year there is a continuous rise over the last 50 years and it's clear the reason for that is the burning of fossil fuels. The fossil fuels add CO2 into the atmosphere continuously. Part of it, we will learn that later, is going into the ocean and is absorbed there. But still about half of it stays in the atmosphere and produces the so-called greenhouse effect. So it produces global warming. We learned already that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And this lecture now is to understand that from the physics point of view, why CO2 produces a greenhouse effect and why it produces global warming. If we go back to our fourth lecture, we had this picture here. There we have understood that our Sun is a nuclear fusion reactor with the equivalent of 300,000 trillion nuclear power stations on Earth. It's really a huge power generator, the Sun. And the kind of power it generates is basically heat and light. And as you know, the energy from the Sun heats up the Earth. So there's not only arriving the um, solar energy which we can convert into electricity, but even without uh, photovoltaic panels, the energy arrives on the Earth and produces heat. On the transparency here, we see that the intensity of the solar light goes with 1 over R square. So with the inverse of the square of the radius. The radius is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. This was 150 million kilometers, so this was a huge distance. And still in this distance, we have a high intensity. And the intensity that arrives on the Earth was 1.4 kilowatt hours per square meter. Let's first try to understand these numbers in a bit more detail. 
So physics tells you that the larger the distance is, the less intensity the light has. So if we would be much closer to the sun, it would be much brighter. And the further away we are, the smaller is the amount of energy which arrives here. So let's have a look at the whole solar system. There we have the sun in the center and then we have planets. I didn't put all of them here, but a few ones as an example. So there's Mercury close to the sun, then there's Earth and there's Mars behind the sun and Jupiter and Saturn are far away. This physics law tells you now that the intensity of the sunlight is reciprocally proportional to the square of the distance to the sun. This complicated sentence, so the intensity of the sunlight is reciprocally proportional to the square of the distance of the sun, is too complicated to really understand it. Therefore, physicists use mathematics as a language so mathematics is the language which a physicist and most scientists are using. This is a universal language which anybody on the world can understand if he has the background of it. And in this language, you write it the following way. And you have our first equation here. The intensity of the sunlight we call I. The distance to the sun we call R, this is the radius, and the proportionality is done by this wiggle in between. So the intensity is proportional to something which is related to the radius. And it's not directly related to the radius, but it's the inverse of the square of the radius. That is why this written I is proportional to 1 over R square. This is a basic physics law, and in a second I will explain you why it looks like that. But let's take the test. We know in physics what the temperature of all these planets are. So let's start with the sun as a star. It has a very high temperature because there's a nuclear fusion reactor inside. The temperature of the sun is about 5.5 thousand degrees of Celsius high. So very hot. That's why it's glowing so bright. The next planet on my list is Mercury. It has a temperature of 167 degrees Celsius. Earth has an average temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. Then we have Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Mars has minus 55, Jupiter minus 108 and Saturn minus 139. If you go further away, you find out that it's getting colder and colder when you are far away. If we go deep into the universe, what we find is it is not minus infinity Celsius because that doesn't exist in physics. The smallest temperature which is in physics available is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Actually, the universe is a few degrees higher than that. So the absolute zero is minus 273 about and the universe is minus 270 degrees, so this 3 degrees of heat, which is still in the universe, which is very little, this 3 degrees above the absolute zero of the temperature scale, this comes from the Big Bang. The Big Bang heated up the universe and it's cooling down since then. And today the temperature went down to almost the absolute zero of the temperature scale but not quite, it's still about three degrees higher than that. So that is due to the Big Bang. But this is not the point here. The point here is now, if you look at these numbers and you compare them, you really find out that the further away the planets are, the colder they are. This is because of this one over R square law, which says the larger the distance, the smaller the intensity of the sun is. Why does this 1 over R squared law work so well? Well, the point is, this is not even physics, but it's basically mainly mathematics behind it. If you draw the angle between the light from the sun to the earth, then you have a cone. 
and this cone has a so-called solid angle. And this solid angle can be calculated in mathematics. So it's pure mathematics. It tells you that the further away the cone goes, the larger the area in the cone becomes and it goes with the square of the radius. Actually, this is fundamental mathematics, but only in a three-dimensional space. So in mathematics, you can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dimensional spaces. And in every space, there's a different law. Our world is three dimensional. Our space is three dimensional. And therefore, mathematics tells you that in our space, the light intensity goes with one over R square. If we would live in a seven dimensional world, we would have another law. So this intensity law tells you not something only about light and intensities, but also about the dimensions of your space. That is why I like physics so much, because if you really understand physics, you can really learn a lot about very deep things in nature. Let's take physics aside a little bit and go back to our problem. So from pure mathematics now, you can calculate the intensity which arrives at your solar panel by taking the total intensity of the sun, which is 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watt, and you divide it by the radius squared, so the distance squared between sun and earth. This is 149.6 times 10 to the 9 meter squared, and then Mathematics tells you that there has to be a factor of 4 pi in it. This has to do with the mathematics of the solid angle. And if you put all these numbers in, you get this 1.4 kilowatt per square meter. So this is how you calculate the intensity of the sun at a certain distance. So now let's calculate the total amount of energy which goes into the surface of the Earth. So the Earth is hit by the sunlight and in the ideal case now we can say instead of having a bowl which is round and blue, we have a black disk which is just two-dimensional. Then you can calculate the total area. The total area is pi times r squared. This is the area of a, of a disk. This is the same calculation as for solar panels. You take the area of the solar panel and multiply it by 1.4 kilowatt per square meter. Now you take the area of the Earth, which is pi times r square. r is now not the distance from sun to Earth, as we had before, but this capital R here is the radius of the Earth. So the radius square times pi gives you the area of the Earth multiplied with 1.4 kilowatt per square centimeter gives you the total energy which arrives on Earth. So that is the solar energy which heats up the Earth. To calculate the temperature of the Earth, the incoming light is not enough because if there's energy coming from the sun arriving on the Earth, the Earth would get warmer and warmer and the longer the sun is shining, the hotter it would be. Now we have to have a second effect in physics, which we have to understand. This effect is that if a body is warm, any type of material, when you warm it up, it starts to radiate heat. Yeah? And this is the same with Earth. So if the Earth is at a certain temperature, the warmer it is, the more heat it radiates to the universe and therefore the earth is not getting hotter and hotter this time but it stays at a certain constant temperature which is an equilibrium and in this equilibrium the power which comes from the sun heats up the earth and the rising temperature radiates away heat radiation and then there's some equilibrium afterwards. So let's calculate that but first let's understand what heat radiation is. The best way to understand heat radiation is when you have a camera which is able to measure infrared. In such an infrared camera, if you make a picture of your dog, for example, you see 
And this is a camera which does some color coding. You see the yellow color means there's a lot of heat radiation, a lot of infrared radiation coming out. And where the skin is, the temperature is smaller and therefore there is less heat coming out. You can also feel it yourself if you are in a cold room and you have a warm hand and you put the hand in front of your face. Even if your eyes are closed, you feel the hand because you feel the heat radiation which comes from your hand. So if you have a colleague, close your eyes and he puts your hand in front of you, you feel this hand from the infrared radiation. So it has nothing to do with an aura or whatever, it's just infrared radiation coming out of your hands and coming also out of your face. You use this technically, for example, in these infrared cameras which can, where you can make, for example, a photo of your house. And when your house is well insulated, it has a low temperature and at areas in the winter and you're heating inside, at areas where there's a bad insulation, the outer surface temperature of the house is quite large. And you can see that then in your infrared camera. So this can also be done qualitatively and in this diagram you see the physics law behind it. So this radiation is called black body radiation because every black body has the same curve. If your body has a color in a certain sense um, then you have to modify this a little bit but the basic physics law is the same. So this plot shows you the intensity in watt per square meter of radiation which the body emits. And on the horizontal scale you have the temperature in Kelvin. Kelvin is the same as Celsius except that it has a shift by 273 degrees. So zero Kelvin is the absolute zero temperature in physics. And then in one Kelvin steps it goes up like in one Celsius steps. So you see, for example, there's uh, shown where the body temperature is, where the room temperature usually is. Ice, even at zero degrees Celsius, so 273 degrees Kelvin, has infrared radiation, so it also has heat radiation, even if the temperature is small. Okay, and then you have this law here, the intensity of the energy which is given out by infrared radiation is calculated as 4 pi times r squared times sigma times t to the fourth power. This law is a so-called Stefan Boltzmann law. The important thing about it is that the higher the temperature is the more heat radiation you have and this goes even with the fourth power so twice as high temperature in Kelvin means that the amount of black body radiation, the amount of infrared radiation is not two times, not two times two equal four, but four times four, which is two to the four, which is a factor of 16 higher than without this factor of two in the temperature. The R is the radius of the object, assuming it's a round object, it's a bowl. 4 times pi times R squared is the surface of a bowl. This is also mathematics and the surface multiplied with the temperature to the fourth power is then proportional to the total infrared radiation. And then there's a constant. This is the sigma here, this so-called Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 8 in watts per square meter and Kelvin to the fourth power. This is a basic physical constant which you can measure in the lab. And the number you measure in the lab is valid in the whole universe. And uh, so we can also apply it to our solar system. So coming back to our solar system, we have the incoming energy from the sun, we have the outgoing infrared energy which is radiated away from the earth, from our planet, 
then you use these two equations which we have learned before. And then in the equilibrium, the emission, which is emitted from the planet Earth, and the insulation, which is coming from the Sun, those two energies have to be exactly the same. When this is the case, you have the equilibrium. And you can calculate, you take the two formula for P in and P out and set them equal to each other. And then you get this equation down here. And you see on both sides you have an R squared, so you can cancel that. And what is left over are constants and a, a factor t to the 4. So what does this mean? First of all, very important is that the R does not appear anymore in this equation. The R is uh, scratched out. So independent of the radius of a planet, the temperature is always the same. So the in equilibrium temperature can be calculated according to this formula and it's found out that it's independent of the size of the planet. So if this Earth would be larger or smaller, it would have basically the same temperature. So it just depends on the distance from the Sun. From the equation now you can calculate T. T is there to the fourth power, so to get T you have to take the fourth root. Out of these constants here, you have to make sure that you calculate your temperature in the formula in Kelvin. So to convert it to Celsius, you have to subtract this 273.15. And if you then calculate that with the right numbers, you get a temperature of plus 5 degrees Celsius. So in the simplest calculation, according to the Stefan Boltzmann law, the temperature of the Earth should be 5 degrees Celsius. We know this is almost correct, but we have done a few simplifications here, which are not completely true. The first simplification is that the Earth is not a black ball, but it has some color, which means it is reflecting, for example, blue light from the oceans. So we have to take into account that some of the light is here reflected as these blue arrows from the Earth. And therefore there is not as much solar energy arriving here. Part of it is reflected. We have to subtract that. If you do that, if you use the right numbers, the right number is that there is about a 30% loss of solar energy due to reflections. Then you do the calculation again and you get minus 18 degrees Celsius as an average temperature on the Earth. If you do the measurements, as we have shown before, the average real temperature on Earth is plus 15. So our correction made our estimate even worse. So we are off by some numbers, but at least we are in the right order of magnitude compared to minus 270 in the universe and to plus 5000 on the sun. But we have to understand why we don't get the completely right value here. To understand it better, we can do another nice exercise. So there's not only the Earth here, we also have our Moon. And our Moon has basically the same distance to the sun as we have, as we are both on the same orbit, more or less. So let's calculate what the temperature of the Moon is. Well, the Moon has the same distance from the Sun. The Moon has a smaller radius, but we learned that our formula, our equilibrium formula does not depend on the radius of the planet and not on the Moon as well. So we can calculate it and we get out for a black ball the same plus 5 degrees Celsius. If we take into account the reflections from the Moon, they are smaller than on the Earth, so there's about 12% losses by reflection. So we get an average temperature on the Moon of minus 3 degrees Celsius. What is the actual temperature of the Moon? Well, the actual temperature of the Moon, what the astronauts found out was that in the Sun, it's plus 130 degrees Celsius, and in the dark at night, it is minus 160 degrees Celsius. 
So you get completely different numbers than we expect. What is happening here? Well, it's clear. The main difference of Earth and Moon is that the Moon has no atmosphere. Because there's no atmosphere, there's no air which can be warmed up by the Sun. So the Sun hits the surface of the Moon and it gets very hot then. It's plus 130 degrees Celsius. So if you walk there on barefoot, you will have problems. At night, there, so on the dark side of the Moon, the dark side of the Moon is there where the shadow of the Moon is seen. So if there's new Moon, it's dark on the side of the Moon where we look at. There you have minus 160 degrees Celsius. So if you come out of your spaceship in the morning and you walk out bare feet again, with minus 160 degrees, it's also a problem. You will just get stick on the ground. So the atmosphere plays a dominant role in the temperature of the planet. This is our message now. So for the first shot, we got the approximately right order of magnitude for the temperature of the Earth. But to do it properly, we have to understand the atmosphere. And that is where the greenhouse effect comes into play. And the greenhouse effect is something which we will discuss in the next lecture. So thank you for listening. I hope it was not too complicated in, in point of physics and mathematics. And hope to see you again next lecture when we talk about the greenhouse. Thank you.